All right, good morning, church. Good morning. Just one. Morning. Morning. <laughs> hey, thank you, Clark, for the music on this day, the uh, June 26th, 2023. My final, my final Sunday in a pulpit as an appointed pastor. Uh, I'm planning on preaching again. I've already been contacted by a couple of my colleagues down in the Fresno area where we're moving to who asked me if I'd be glad to fill the pulpit for them on vacation time. And I said, of course, I'd love to. I'd love to preach. Uh, but this is my last time in the pulpit as an appointed pastor of a church. Uh, and it's, it's, it's been a joy, especially here at Aldersgate. Uh, one of the things that I've really enjoyed about being in Aldersgate from my very first Sunday here is that this church has always had good lay leadership uh, good music ministry. Uh, from the first Sunday, all I had to do was come in and preach. Now, since about my second year here, when I began playing bass in the praise band, and of course I've always been a choir singer, uh, my time in the worship service grew. But that's okay, that was a blessing. I'm doing something I really enjoy, not something that was expected of me. And uh, it has been a real blessing. And so I, I, I retire with, with a good heart. Uh, and a joyous heart. And uh, in fact, my sermon text for today is Paul, in essence, saying goodbye. A lot of Paul's later writings, you get the impression that he knew his ministry was about to come to an end. And today's reading is one of those. It's interesting, though, because it follows a reading that we looked at a couple of weeks ago. I'm going to read that. I know, I know the text says verse 4 to 6. Uh, is that what it says? Yes. Okay. Six to eight. Six to eight. <laughs> uh, but I want to read ver verses one through five. It was one of my sermon texts, again, earlier in this year. I'm not going to, to really expound on it, but I want you to see the foundation of what I am reading today. And so reading from the New, New International Version, First Timothy, Second Timothy, <laughs> even on my last Sunday, I still don't get it right. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 8. And 1 through 5 is what I preached on a couple of weeks ago. And it says this, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine, Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers who say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. And like I said, that was the text of one of my sermons. I think it was called Some Instructions. If you want to go back on YouTube and look at past, you, you can also just look for the scripture text, which is always there uh, on the heading of the sermon, uh, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 6. So that's the context. Paul talking about people uh, in the last days, uh, but, but he encourages Timothy, do the work of an evangelist, discharge the duties, of all your ministry and also be ready to preach. And then Paul says this after having written that, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness with the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. The sense of reading of God's holy word may grant us understanding this day. So I, I, you may sense what I'm, what I'm saying, that in Paul's later writings, it seems like he knows his ministry is coming to an end. This is what he says. You know, I, and the time has come for my departure. Now, it, it may mean he may have been writing this one in one of the places he was in prison while trying to go to Rome. It's my time for my departure heading on to Rome, which if you read the book of Acts, he gets there at the end of the book of Acts. But he says this about himself before that time of departure, and it's verse 7. 
I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And as I was planning my sermons this year, wondering what will be my last scripture text to preach on, this text came to my mind. I have fought the good fight. And when I look at what Paul says, those three things, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. I find myself examining myself by those three idioms, whatever word we can use, and ask myself on my last Sunday here, how have I done in my ministry, in my career? Paul says, I have fought the good fight. A large part of me wants to say, no, I did what I thought was necessary, not exactly fighting the good fight. When I was in seminary, I wrote a paper. I forgot for which class, but I remember the paper. The name of the paper was, the title of the paper was, The Super Pastor Must Die. Uh, professor didn't like it too well. Uh, well, because one of the things in it, I, <laughs> I mentioned being at Fuller's graduation the year before where I got paid to be an usher. And you know, when you're a starving student, you'll take whatever you can. And watching the, the parade of professors coming down the center of the aisle, this was held in the very same uh, arena theater where they used to film the, the, the Emmy Awards. It's now in another location. And I'm watching all these, these professors come down in their multicolored myriad robes and, and, and different kinds of stoles and hoods. And of course, there's sergeant stripes on their arms. And I, I thought, you know, you know, is this supposed to be an impression? And, and you heard me say a couple of weeks ago that I, I don't like wearing robes. And so just with, with that thought, I got to thinking about so many other things that go on in the church. Is that what is the role of the pastor? And a lot of people say, well, the pastor will do this and the pastor will do that. And the pastor will do this and the pastor will do that. And pastors, and, and in my ministry, I have been measured by many of those expectations. But when I balance that with Paul, who says the role of the pastor teacher is to equip the saints for the purposes of ministry. I really begin to chafe against the, that expectation that the pastor will basically do everything in the church for everybody. And I have seen pastors, I followed one who did that. And I gotta tell you, it was 10 years of hell trying to follow somebody who did something, everybody had expectation, that's what a good pastor is. You know, yeah, well, then why did you ask him to leave? If the role of the pastor teacher is to equip the saints for ministry, that is what I have tried to do. Now, I don't know whether I did a good job at it or not. I told you what I've liked about Aldersgate since I got here. We have good lay leadership. Larry's sitting right here in front of me. We've had Dwayne Nelson, we've had Mike Muller, we, 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 we've had Brian Graves, we, uh, we had Teresa Mitchell. Mitchell, all of a sudden I wanted to say a whole different last name. Uh, 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 Veronica Davis does it now for us. Uh, making the announcements, giving the pastoral prayer, uh, 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 leading people in, in, in worship, let's now sing the hymns. That's stuff that I've always been expected to do at other churches, and I'm so glad I didn't have to do it here. We've had good music ministry here. Clark Minor and then George Finley and back to Clark Minor again. I don't have to pick the hymns. I don't have to lead him in singing. Folks, I have greatly appreciated that. Pastoral prayer time, whoever the, the lay leader has been on that day, they pray that prayer. Children's moment, never gave a one in the 12 years I've been here. And you know, thank you. Thank you, thank you others. There were some real good ones. <laughs> So, you know, to, if the role of the pastor teacher is to equip the saints for ministry, that means if somebody says, well, Scott, the banners haven't been changed. For me, if I'm going to try to fight the good fight to not be the super pastor, I'm going to say, well, then change them. Larry, do I know the colors that are supposed to be up there? When you look at your calendar. <laughs> so in other words, let's, let's parse that. The answer is... Sometimes. <laughs> you booger. The answer is no. The role of the pastor teacher is to equip the saints for the purposes of ministry, not to do everything for them. I knew a guy 
who would shine your shoes and wipe your nose. And if your sister was having surgery in Texas, he'd put you in his car and drive you there. I'm sorry, folks. That's, that's, that's way beyond. Oh, boy, that really built love. Oh, you know, this is how much my pastor cares for me. Well, he's driving you to Texas. What about the sheep that are still at home while he's gone? Have I fought the good fight? Well, it all depends on how you interpret what my ministry has been, what I have done. My, my leadership style has been kind of laissez-faire, you know, kind, kind of a hands-off thing. We had a, Larry and I were talking about this a couple of weeks ago. We had a man here at Aldersgate who uh, left because there was a proposal to our leadership team and he was on our leadership team. And I wasn't for the proposal, but what I wrote was, let's talk about it at leadership. That's my style. I could have come out and said, no, I'm opposed to this, it isn't gonna happen. But then why have a leadership team? This is supposed to be a ministry, not an autocracy. So have I really fought the good fight? Well, I guess it depends on which way you're looking at it. Point one. Second thing, I have finished the race. Now this is why I think Paul just really knew his, his life was winding down. I have finished the race. Well, I've already told you that uh, I love to preach and I've already had two churches contact me and say, would you preach for us? Well, our pastor's on vacation. My answer is yes. So guess what? Uh, I haven't finished the race. I'm still in it. If I'm still preaching, I'm still in the race. The, uh, Chris Gardner asked me if I would be the, the speaker for this year's men's August retreat, men's retreat at, at Shasta camp. And I looked at him and I said, really? He says, yeah. He goes, you're retired. It doesn't mean you can't preach. Well, within our book of discipline, we have a thing that as the pastor, I'm not supposed to have any contact with the ministry of the church I serve for one year. And, and Chris said, well, according to Lee Nish, a friend of ours and a friend of some of yours, he says, no, this is the district retreat. It's not Aldersgate retreat. So Scott's not breaking any rules if he comes to be our speaker. Well, okay, I'll let you debate that one if you wish. But no, I haven't finished the race. I'm finishing ministry as a vocation. I am not finishing it as a part of the call of who I am. I'm personally hoping to go to Fresno and do something I really haven't done much here in Chico, but I did many times in every other community I, in, I, I, I was in. Do funerals. I want to go to the, the local morticians, introduce myself, and now I can say I'm a retired pastor. They love hiring retired pastors. And, and if you have some, some people who don't have a pastor, I'll be glad to do it. Uh, I didn't do very many here because I was busier here in Chico than I was in any other church prior to, to what was that called? COVID-19. We have our, our, our leadership team meetings, our trustees meetings, our finance meetings on Mondays. We had Awana on Tuesdays. I had my Bible study on Wednesday. We had choir practice and praise team practice on, on Thursdays. Now, Friday was my day off, but there's a number of times I came in to speak at Celebrate Recovery on Friday. Uh, not always everything on Saturday, but we had a number of events on Saturday. So with those events going on, I didn't go to the local morticians here and say, hey, I'm Scott Allred, I'll be glad to come and do a funeral for you. It's funny, I, I, I think I, I can count every funeral I've done here in 12 years on both hands and almost both feet. Uh, 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 Debbie's one of them, as I'm, I'm sitting there looking at you. And what's interesting about that is two funerals I did were for a family not even from Chico. They lived in Reno, but they were born here. They had a family plot here, and they came here, and, and they said, you know, our loved one had a background in United Methodism, so I did the funeral. Several years later, <laughs> I get this phone call from one of the morticians here in town. He goes, hey, we got some people here who are looking for that guy that drives that convertible. <laughs> Gee, who is that? You, you know, uh, 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 Ron Palmer's service. See, I can almost name them all. It hasn't been that many. And, and, and funerals, I really love the, uh, 
the, the aspects of grace that goes on between you and that mourning family at that time. It's like no other time in somebody's life. Uh, I've, I've ended up with some good friendships because of some funerals that I have done. Heck, years ago, I ended up with a whole wardrobe full of clothes because these women would say, hey, you're my husband's size. Would you want to try on some of his clothes? You and I said, yes, absolutely, yes. <laughs> you know? And uh, uh, in fact, big Chris Fredrickson, who I've talked about a lot back in 2004, we were going to fly to Hawaii and that was going to make 50 out of 50 on our, on our vacation trips. And I said, to God, we had some problems with our Stratus. And since we've been gone for a week, Chris can keep the car, no big deal. And I said, Chris, I want you to be thinking about this. Next Tuesday, I'm going to be in a beach in Waikiki. I want you to think about that. And he says, Scott, I'm not going to be thinking about that. So what are you going to be thinking about? Because I'm going to think about all the people that died in order for you to afford this trip to home. <laughs> that particular year, I did 30 funerals. Uh, so, is the race over? No. The vocation is over. But the call is going to continue. And I hope to continue to do it. So, no, the race is not over for me, folks. It's just slowed down a slight bit. And then the final thing he says, I have kept the faith. I do believe I was graduated from seminary in 1985. I worked two years as a youth director for Santa Valley United Methodist Church. Two years while I was still in seminary. I was hired by Carson City First United Methodist Church because Bob Schwartz, who was the pastor there, was on the Board of Ordained Ministry for the Sacramento District. And when I interviewed there, he called up the district superintendent. He says, hey, is this guy available? Because we can use somebody to do youth work. We can use somebody to do choir. And uh, they hired me. I interviewed there and they hired me. Then my first appointment was in uh, Downeyville, North San Juan, Sierra City, not too far from here. Uh, and then I uh, went to St. Mark's and then Wasco and here. And that, that's, that's my career. Um, looking for a place in 1985 and 84, interviewing with different churches, that was a struggle of faith in the matter of do I trust God? Because I broke out in red hides on my arms and on my legs. I've told you this story before. Uh, I went to a doctor in Pasadena and he's looking at me and he says, hey, I can, I can give you some medication for this. He says, but I got a question to ask you. I said, what's that? He says, you're, you're a, he says, what are you worried about? told him, I said, I'm about to graduate from seminary and I don't have a church to go to and that's really on my mind. He says, uh-huh, uh-huh. He says, uh, you're graduating from seminary, huh? I said, yeah, because that means you're going to be a pastor, huh? I said, yeah. He says, what are you worrying about? Don't you pray? I mean, you know, I just, <laughs> I really, I look at this guy and I go, what? He goes, look, man, the reason why you're broken out in hives is you are so worried about this. And you're not trusting in God. Man, trust in God. That's who you want to work for, right? He says, so here's your prescription. It's a cream you can put on your arms and legs. He says, but my advice to you, man, is quit worrying and let God lead you where he's supposed to be. I never fulfilled that prescription. My arms cleared up in a week. That's probably the biggest challenge of faith I had. And well, there were some financial challenges we had over the years. I've talked to you about those. Uh, but but probably the biggest challenge of faith. And it wasn't, is God alive? It wasn't, am I saved? It was, where am I going to go? Two different things. And, and I've told you about the end of the year. I went and I pulled out my calendar and I started to throw it away. In January, I transferred any dates I had, but then I started looking through the calendar. And I saw in, 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 in July where I flew to Reno, to interview at Carson City and how Francis and I drove to Reno on July 22nd. We celebrated my birthday there in Carson City. Uh, how we moved there on August 2nd. I mean, all this is written out. And then all the other churches that I interviewed with during those, those previous six months and, and how worried I was and how I felt on that, uh, that January of, of, of 1986 
how blessed I was to be in Carson City. I felt I was at the exact place I was supposed to be, led by God. And I realized God was with me the whole time. That doctor was absolutely right. So we had some financial challenges, which uh, I didn't break out in highs, praise be to God. Uh, but uh, I often talk about Carl the Lutheran. <laughs> uh, Carl and Linda Johnson, great people. They do go to a Lutheran church, uh, they, but they've been coming to my Bible study. I think we talked about the other night that Carl was one of the original ones that were here my first night here. And he mentioned in men's breakfast on Cozy Diner on last Tuesday, he says, I liked how Scott taught, and so I wanted to come on Wednesday night. That's, you know, that, that's how Carl came. Uh, I was at Cozy Diner one Tuesday morning and trying to pay for my breakfast, and my credit card was denied. And I'm on my ATM. And I said, please run it again. It was denied again. I said, oh, I've got a credit card out in my car. And Carl says, here, let, let me take care of it for you. Went to the bank, I had $4 in the bank. That's why it was denied. And, and uh, I mean, we, th this was the end of the first year here. It was in January. And uh, Francis had uh, just been hired out in Oroville and financially we were hurting. And we were wondering how are we gonna make it through the month of July because Francis doesn't get paid the month of July. And uh, whole, I mean, just really a lot of worry. And we made it through the whole month, but my, my accountant, Kelly, Kelly Bullis suggested we take out a small loan, personal loan, to, 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 to cover our, I said, I don't want to, that's, we're already in debt, I don't want to take, but it all worked out to where we made it through July without a problem, and then a, a great piece of news happened. We got Francis's new contract for the new year, and it was $20,000 higher than the previous year. Right away I said, whoa, our, our, our whole situation has changed. And in all my worry about what was happening financially, did either one of us realize that since Frances was hired in October and she went to work in November, they weren't gonna give her a full year salary? So the next year, the salary was reflective of an entire year. Now, instead of being behind financially, we're looking at, at the end of the year, being ahead by $10,000. Praise be to God! We, we, we never had another summer like that. We never had another, another time like that. God has blessed us, and in some ways, we've been able to bless others because of it. Praise be to God. Uh, but did, did I ever lose my faith in God? No, I worried. Not the same thing. I never, ever doubted that God would see us through. These last three days have been another interesting challenge. Now look, at it's my own fault because I didn't go home and pack up. I went home and watched baseball games. Okay, I packed some books up, yeah, yeah, yeah. But here it is, Monday comes, the movers are coming on Friday and I've got a whole house to pack up. And and, and we had some people come by on Monday, uh, Rosenel and Shopman, Ted, Ted Sandrowski, uh, who else was there? Ken and Sarah Lynn. Ken and Sarah Lynn. Uh, Peg uh, McElroy was there, and there was somebody else that I'm missing. Uh, oh, 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 Scotty came by, uh, uh, Scott Strewell. And we started packing boxes up. Rose says, hey, you guys have too much stuff here. Let us know if you want to come back another day. So Tuesday came and went. I was in my office packing my office up, not touching anything in the house. So I, I sent a note out to Rose, hey, yeah, we, I, I, I'd love to take, take advantage of you uh, on, on Tuesday. And so she and Eldon came, I mean, on Wednesday, she and Eldon came by yesterday and we packed some more boxes. Again, Rose said, what time do you want us to come by tomorrow? That was today. And I said, nine o'clock. She says, I'll, I'll send out some notices. So today Rose shows up, Diane Evans shows up, uh, 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 Dorothy Dahlke shows up, and Shelly Young shows up. So I got four women in the house packing boxes. And, and I'm still going, well, okay, uh, I don't know that I'm really seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. These guys are coming tomorrow. They showed up today. The movers showed up today. And you know what they did? They got off the truck. They brought out boxes. They brought out tape. They brought out blankets. And they started packing our house. I told Larry when I came in here today, we received a godsend today from the movers helping us, a total opposite 
experience we had 12 years ago, because 12 years ago it was miserable. A miserable experience in the movie. And I'm looking at these guys going, man, I appreciate all of you. And I thank you that you came here and you did this. I think I'll even sleep well tonight. And Shelly said, go home and get a good night's rest. And I said, Shelly, I haven't slept well in two weeks. And Francis said, it's been longer than that. Does God work things out? Yes. If I have a challenge of faith, it's like, I know that God's going to do it, but I start to worry. And you know the old cliche, why pray when you can worry? I don't think that I have lost the faith. I think I've kept the faith. I've tried to be a man of faith. You know, faith again. What was my first sermon here in Aldersgate 12 years ago? Faith is illogical. Faith is illogical. Thank you, brother. That was my first sermon. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. That is an absolute illogical statement, but that's what it is. I'm going to believe without seeing. I'm going to have an assurance that the things that I hope for are going to come about. And now, uh, because of what went on today, I think I will sleep well tonight. I'm not concerned about tomorrow. Larry and I still got to do a couple of things. We're going to uh, I'm giving him a weight, a weight bench that we have over there in the storage room. I got maybe six more things in the storage room tonight. I'm going to go over here and finish packing up my office. And uh, Folks, I now know, I know it's all going to be taken care of. Saturday, don't know what we're going to do. Everything's packed up. Go over to the house and watch Dwayne pull up carpet. <laughs> you know, but then uh, we'll be here on Sunday for the, uh, for the, for the party and the barbecue that's going to happen. And uh, God is good all the time. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. That includes you who's listening to this. So folks, if you were looking at your life, how would you measure up with these three things? I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I hope that I've told you how I look at that on my life. And praise God. Thank you for being a part of my life. Thank you for being a part of ministry of Aldersgate. Not only in the physical presence here, but for those of you on the internet. Yes, Brother Arlen, I know you're going to have to either find another church or start listening to Scott Gesper, who will be recording starting next week. <laughs> All right, and for those of you watching, who's Arlen? Uh, Arlen Vanderhoff, friend of mine through Cars, uh, who is in, uh, what's the name of that city again, Michigan? Forest Glen. Something Glen. Uh, sorry, sorry, brother. Uh, I know you'll correct me on Facebook, uh, but, but Arlen was one of the first guys that started watching these YouTube broadcasts when we started doing them in 2020. And he and his son, uh, Chad, and his wife, Vicki, watch, as well as many other people. Uh, my, my, my cousin, Kathy Martindale from North Carolina Rubbish, because you know I watch you every now and then. Well, thank you. Praise be to God. Uh, you might see me again someday. Who knows? Be blessed. Keep the faith. God will be with you.